Welcome all of you to this live program at Authority Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Prabhudev Prasad Purdapa from Boston, Massachusetts. After completing his post-graduation in PGA Chandigarh, Dr. Purdapa pursued fellowships in Mass General Hospital, Boston, Nadal Reconstruction Fellowship at the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis, and a fellowship in sports medicine at the Tri Orthopedic Center. He currently serves as assistant professor in Boston University School of Medicine and attending orthopedic surgeons at the VA Boston Healthcare System. He's editor of the Archives of Orthopedics Journal and also serves as peer reviewer for several high impact journals. He's published extensively across several top orthopedic journals and also has several high impact publications to his credit. So notice Dr. Pradappa has delivered several lectures on our channel and today it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Prabhudev Prasad Pradappa for this wonderful live program. Over to you Prabhu. Hi, thank you, Tesha. Thank you one more time uh, you know, to, for this opportunity to talk about one more topic here and welcome everyone for this uh, topic. So today I'm going to talk about a uh, step-by-step -step approach to total hypothesis with the direct antenna approach on a standard operating table. So I'm not going to be talking about um, you know, the differences between different approaches and which approach is better. So this is going to be just uh, purely a uh, uh, a technique topic uh, uh, regarding a step-by-step -step approach, how you can do a direct enter approach on a standard operating table. Uh, these are mainly my steps. This is how I do it. Uh, something. Okay, there you go. All right. Um, so like any other surgeries, preoperative planning is very important and uh, obviously the patient uh, uh, needs to be medically optimized. Uh, patient selection is very important, I think, uh, because this approach, um, especially if you're switching from a posterior or a direct lateral approach to a direct anterior approach, I think initially patient selection is very important. You don't want to be operating on some patients which are not good candidates for a direct anterior approach. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, some of the um, uh, large patients, morbidly obese patients, they're, they're not easy to you know, approach to this uh, dirt and approach. Uh, young muscular patients, they are also uh, often difficult because big muscles and retraction with this smaller approach is not, not easy. Um, and some of the difficult anatomies like uh, uh, a short and wider step of neck. Those are also usually not that easy. And uh, if there is significant protrusio and any previous uh, surgeries with previous with deformities of the stablum of the femur are usually not um, a good candidates for a anterior approach, especially when you're you know, starting off. Um, so patient selection is very important initially, I think. Um, and uh, like any other total hypothoplasty, uh, radiographic templating is very important, and that gives you uh, good um, assessment of your the sizes which you're going to be using, uh, the leg lengths, um, and also the offset, which everything can be planned preoperatively so that you can, um, it makes your surgery that much easier. Um, so this, uh, like I said, though, we're going to be talking about um, anti dirt anti approach on a standard table. Um, um, as you know, definitely this can be done um, safely on a, a fracture table or something like this. And probably this is this this is, it's more more surgeons actually do them on a special table like this. Uh, there are some advantages. There are some uh, disadvantages of uh, using either type of table. So I, I, I learned it this way on a standard operating table. And um, I, for in my hands, I feel that is safer. So that's what I've been doing. Uh, so, the, uh, so some of the benefits are obviously you don't need an expensive uh, specialized table uh, if it is not available in the hospital. And uh, they can directly evaluate the leg lens clinically on a standard operating table. And also uh, intraoperatively, you can evaluate the hip stability. Unlike uh, when the patient is on a fracture table, then it's, it's not possible to, you know, it, it, you can try, but it's difficult to take the leg out of the traction and assess the, uh, the hip stability, which I think is very important. So uh, the setup and uh, positioning. Um, so 
the, again, the standard operand table, you can see it here. Uh, this is the head end and that's the leg end, you can see that. And typically this part is on the head end and uh, you'll have to bring it on the leg end so that um, when you slide the patient down, uh, in this you have more table uh, towards the leg end of the patient. You'll have to place the patient uh, so that the trochanter, the greater trochanter is somewhere at the break of the table. So that's the break of the table. During uh, femur preparation, you'll have to drop the leg end of the table down so that you can get some hyperextension. So the trochanter is typically placed at the level of the break of the table like this. So that's why you need to move the, the, the headpiece towards the leg end of the table. And, um, and most operating table, I think you should be able to slide them down. So slide them up or down. So uh, you need to slide it down all the way so that you can bring the C-arm in and out uh, easily uh, so that you will be able to X-ray the hip. Otherwise, if, if the table is in this position, it would be difficult to get the C-arm in there. So make sure you slide the table down all the way towards the leg end. Um, so that's the uh, patient there. So the, almost the feet is almost at the end of the table uh, there. And uh, the greater trochanter is at the level of the break of the table. And then the perineum, uh, that's the arm, the left arm is um, across the chest with good padding over the chest and it is taped over there because when you're doing the femur prep, you'll be um, standing on the side of the uh, patient over there and you'll be you know, bringing in the brooches in and out. So the left arm should be um, out of the way. So make sure you tape the left arm across the chest. And then um, I prep both the lower extremities. So, um, so, the, so I, uh, I uh, drape the perineum like this. So I use a, a small towel there and uh, place an IO band to cover the perineum completely. Um, this is on the, so in this patient, we're operating on the left side. Um, so this is the right side of the patient, showing the right side of the patient here. I place a post here, it's called a book water post. It's uh, from one of the general surgery uh, retractor set. It's just a post which attaches onto the side of the table. Um, I'll show you later, I use this for holding one of the retractors in place. Uh, instead of being held by an assistant, um, I use that to just you know, hold the retractor over there with a chain. Um, so that goes there. This is somewhere at the level of the, uh, the lower thoracic cage over there. And then I place this, the arm board on the other side or just like this. Uh, this is from the uh, surgical side. So again, in this patient, we are, we are operating on the left side. Uh, so the arm board uh, from the left side is on the uh, right side over here. So this helps in uh, bringing the left lower ex extremity across uh, when you're preparing for the femur. I place a bump underneath the pelvis. Um, this again, this is about just about a couple inches in thickness, one to two inches in thickness. Uh, you can just you know, place a folded blanket there. Um, otherwise you can you know, place a, a firm gel pad. So this helps with a couple of things. If the patient is big, like a slightly obese type of patient, it helps in um, you know, sagging down some of the, uh, the soft tissue, the fat from the lateral, anterolateral aspect of the thigh so it can sag down. And also by lifting the pelvis up, you have a little bit of space um, in the lower part here. Uh, when you're preparing the acetabulum, this will help in pushing the femur down because femur is in the way when you're preparing the acetabulum. So uh, by lifting the pelvis up a couple inches, you will have some space to push the femur down. Um, so like I said, I prep both the lower extremities, but definitely it can be safely done by pre preparing only the, uh, the surgical side. Um, the, the main advantages of uh, preparing both the lower extremities is you can check the leg lens easily uh, because you know, they're right there. You can just feel the medial malleoli on both the sides. And another thing is, um, like I mentioned, Getting the femur hyperextension is very important when you're you know, broaching the femur. 
So this uh, helps when you when you have the other leg prepped, you can easily just lift it up and bring the operative side under that uh, the non-operative leg to get good adduction and hyperextension. So I use a, a drape like this is a perineal drape. It has like a center strip which goes over the perineum, so it can you know, cover both the both the legs and also the perineum over there. And then I use a bilateral extremity drape uh, like like this one, like the one we use uh, when we are prepping for a bilateral total knee. And then uh, then you can open up the the upper part over there to uh, expose the hip. Um, so this is this is the right hip. Uh, sorry, you know I had to go go back and forth with the right and the left uh, here. I didn't I, I couldn't get uh, all the good pictures on the same side. Uh, so this is the right hip showing the skin incision. I put my uh, middle finger or just below the anteriorx spine, like shown here, and uh, make my mark just along the out the along the edge of my index finger here. So that usually gives us about a couple of finger breadths away from the ASIS here. So you can see the ASIS mark there. And that's the incision there, slightly going oblique in line with the tensor fascia lata. So sometimes you can, in muscular patients, you should be able to actually feel the TFL between your you know, fingers. And then you just you know, place the incision over there. Uh, typically it is centered over the tip of the greater canter usually about 12 to 15 centimeters length, um, again, depending on the size of the patient, obviously. Um, so it's uh, slightly oblique going towards the lateral side of the thigh. So this is the left hip. Um, now, once you make the incision through the skin and then the subcutaneous fat, and then uh, you mobilize the fat, um, so you should be able to you know, land right on the TFL muscle like here. So you can see it, the thin TFL fascia and the TFL muscle, um, so going across over there. Uh, so you need to move some of the fat over the TFL fascia so that you can expose the TFL there. So that is sartorius coming from the anterior superior iliac spine. That's the TFL muscle. And that's where you have the lateral cutaneous nerve of uh, thigh, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of thigh. So that's the standard Smith-Peterson approach for direct anterior approach to the hip. But as you know, because of the lateral cutaneous nerve, there's a high risk of injury if you go through this approach. So this has been, you know, now it's a standard uh, approach. This has been modified. So you go through the TFL fascia laterally. So you make an incision right through the TFL fascia in the, in the middle of it. And you'll, you know, land right on the TFL muscle. And then you start um, you know, separating the TFL muscle from the TFL fascia, like here. Um, you can initially you have to separate the fibers maybe with a carb elevator or some uh, or you know something at the back of the knife handle, and then you should be able to put your finger there and then dissect the TFL and bring it laterally. Um, so, to, so you should be able to uh, move the finger up and down all the way from proximal to distal end to separate the TFL uh, nicely from the, all the medial structures. Then you place a retractor um, like this. Uh, this is like a self-retaining type of retractor. Um, so now you have the sartorius again, they are retracted anteriorly. Uh, this is the left hip again, and that's the TFL retracted posteriorly. Now you can see that's the rectus muzzle. And uh, somewhere over here is the vastus lateralis, and then the gluteus minimus is deep to the TFL here. Um, so there is a thin fascia which covers, runs over the rectus and then over the uh, covering the vastus lateralis. So we're going to open up this thin fascia like that, starting from over the vastus lateralis, running uh, slightly oblique, going towards the uh, the anterior inferior, anterior inferior iliac spine. That's where the rectus is uh, arising from. And just deep to this fascia is the, the lateral circumflex femoral vessels. So it's very important you identify these blood vessels, otherwise they can you know, cause some troublesome bleeding. So before you open up completely, so make sure you identify them and then coagulate them, just like shown in this picture on the right side here. Um, and then right after that, you'll be able to see some pre 
capsular fat right in this region here. So that's the rectus and uh, deep to the TFL, that's the gluteus minimus and that's vastus lateralis there. So there's a small triangle there and right there is the capsule with the precapsular fat and you can uh, take the capsular fat out and you'll uh, land right onto the, the anterior capsule of the femur. Um, so I've been using this uh, ring retractor. Um, definitely you can, you know, it's not absolutely necessary. Uh, this is, uh, it's made of some thick material. It helps in protecting the skin and subcutaneous tissue and also the, the TFL muscle. We're going back and forth with the reamers and the brooches and it's and it's slightly, this, this is usually a slightly smaller incision. So there is a um, higher risk of damage to the soft tissue. So this has been really helpful for me in protecting the soft tissues. So this goes um, on this side, um, deep to the sartorius on the medial side and deep to the TFL on the lateral side. Uh, but definitely it's not absolutely necessary. If you're you know, careful, I think it should be fine. Um, so after this, then I place two cobra retractors, uh, one inferiorly right there in the inferior part of the neck. Uh, you'll have to elevate the rectus with the carb elevator and then place this cobra right there and other cobra along the superior aspect of the neck. Then I put a large bump, a big bump under the knee to flex the knee and the hip. This will relax the rectus. Then I take a carb elevator to uh, elevate the rectus off the capsule here. Uh, so that I can place another cobra retractor. So this one is a ray, this, uh, this black one is a radiolucent carbon fiber retractor so that you can x-ray through it. And we don't have to remove it uh, you know, frequently when we are taking x-rays. So that retractor goes deep to the rectus, uh, right over the, all, all the way onto the anterior column of the pelvis. So it stays nicely over there, thereby expo exposing the entire capsule um, up to the stabulum. Uh, sometimes the reflected head of the rectus over here is pretty thick coming onto the capsule, and I release that part also um, to uh, get a better exposure. So that's that uh, the carbon fiber radiolucent retractor. So I hold this uh, the radiolucent retractor. Uh, so I, I showed you initially that uh, the post which was on the opposite side. Um, I hold this with a, with a weight and a chain that will the chain um, holding this retractor, the weight wrapped around that post here that will you know, hold that retractor there so that the assistant you know, doesn't have to hold it all the time. Um, now, uh, the next step is once we are on the capsule, then we have to release the capsule. Um, either you can do a capsulectomy or a capsulotomy. Uh, the, there are many studies regarding this, and uh, it has been shown that there is no difference if you either do a capsulotomy or a capsulectomy. So if it is if it is in the way, and uh, you can just take it out completely. So I do a capsulotomy, uh, like a distally based trapezoidal flap, uh, like this. That's the incision uh, from distal to proximal. Um, all the way along, up to the acetabular margin. And then there's the superior capsule there, and then other uh, incision over there using an cartery, and then tag it with some type of sutures. Uh, we can you know, repair it there. We'll repair it later uh, at the end of the surgery. And then uh, we'll reposition the, the cobra retractors um, inside deep to the capsule. Um, now, this one, again, the left hip, you can see the superior and inferior aspect uh, in the wound looking from down below. Uh, that's the femoral head there. Now, um, I, uh, I would like to release the superior capsule, which goes all the way on to the anterior superior aspect of the greater trochanter. This will help in exposing the femoral neck all the way to what's called the saddle part of the neck here. I'll show you that in the next picture here. And also, once you release all this capsule, this helps in uh, later exposure of the acetabulum also. So, so there is a sharp tip cobra there. You can see that on the left side and also right side going right over the tip of the trochanter that will you know, push the 
the gluteus minimus tendon away so that you can uh, safely release all the superior capsule uh, from this region here. So that's where all the superior capsule is attached and that all of that has to be released so that you can um, have a good look at the retrocator and also the, that's the saddle, the superior part of the neck completely. So this is important uh, because uh, to get a better neck cut, you need to expose. So that's the part, once you release the superior capsule, uh, that's the part you should be able to see clearly. And that's the, the what's called the saddle part of the neck there. So you should be able to see that nicely so that we can get a neck cut like that. Uh, definitely the CRM is available and you should be able to you know, bring in the CRM to check your neck cut before you make it. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you should be able to, you know, uh, if, you expo if you get a good exposure, you should be able to get a good neck cut over there. Um, and then if you cut the neck over there, all this remaining part of the bone over here that will limit your visibility of the, the superior, the posterior superior aspect of the trochanter, uh, that's where we'll be releasing the remaining uh, soft tissues to elevate the femur. So it's important that the neck cut goes all the way to the saddle part of the neck there. Then I make another cut over there to uh, get that uh, get a, a good chunk of the femoral neck out so that it will be easier to take the femoral head out later. Um, uh, if you're definitely, you can definitely use the CM uh, when you're doing the neck cuts at this time. So that's the intra picture there. So you, again, this is the left hip, there's the proximal and distal end there. So that's where you want to uh, cut your neck. Obviously you can't see your lesser trochanter uh, in, this, in this position like we see in poster approach. So if you want to confirm this, uh, definitely an X-ray will be helpful. And then I make another cut over there, just, uh, just very close to the stabum so that I can take a good chunk of the femur neck out. And then I use a cork screw to go in the center of the femoral head. Uh, and then use a T-handle to rotate it several times to break all the soft tissue attachments. Then you can pull the uh, femur head out along the superior and uh, enter superior aspect. Um, this is uh, the next step. I, I would like, I, I'd like to release the inferior capsule also before going into the acetabulum. This is a, a right hip. Um, this is again the proximal, as you can see on the right side here. I bring the leg into figure out four position. Uh, that will, uh, then I'll be able to expose the inferior neck nicely. And I can pull on this, the, the capsule, which has been tagged with the suture, and then release the inferior capsule over there all the way to the lesser trochanter. Uh, but not beyond that, up to the lesser trochanter. I use typically in the figure of four position, I can feel the lesser trochanter clearly with my finger. And then if I need to revise my neck cut, then I can go back and revise it um, if needed, depending on how much, uh, depending on the preoperative templating, how much neck length we had planned for. Um, and also releasing this inferior capsule is very essential to push the femur down while exposing the establum and also to lift the femur up while you're exposing the femur. Um, now, this is the left hip again. Sorry for you know, going back and forth because you know, I couldn't take uh, good pictures of the same side. Um, so this is the left hip again. And then uh, you can see that uh, the cobra retractor, the radiolucent retractor, you know, that's been there. Uh, that's the transverse acetabular ligament there on the left side. And then I place this, uh, what's called a single, single prong mural retractor. That's, that's how it looks like. Goes right posterior to the transverse stable ligament. Um, and then I place a double prong mural retractor. That one, it goes posteriorly just outside the labrum, but inside the capsule so that I can expose the labrum nicely. Um, then I start uh, cleaning up the stabulum, clear up all the labrum anteriorly, posteriorly, and if there are any big osteophytes, you can take them out with an osteotome and also take out all the, the fat from the fossa on the medial aspect of the stablum. 
Um, again, so just like poster approach, I use uh, transverse vestibular ligament as my landmark. And as we know, it's a very good landmark for positioning of our, for reaming and positioning of the vestibular uh, cup. Um, obviously, you can definitely take the help of the X-ray during this, uh, during even uh, reaming and also while positioning of the cup. I mainly uh, use the transverse vestibular ligament as my um, anatomical landmark and just take one X-ray just to make sure that the cup is in a good position. Um, so I use an offset reamer like this. That's definitely helpful because you don't have to fight with the femur. The femur is still in the way, especially if you had to, if you had to keep the neck cut long and in some weirdest type of neck uh, anatomy, uh, the femur is right in the way when you're reaming, when we're going you know, in and out with the reamers and also while placing the cup. So an offset reamer like this is helpful. So that's a, a, a trial establisher cup uh, to see how it is fitting before we put the final cup. Um, so that's the transverse stable ligament there again, uh, which is a good landmark for reaming and positioning the cup. Uh, so that's the CM coming in. So uh, usually I set up the scrub, uh, the scrub table, the scrub tech is on the opposite side, which helps in the easy flow. Um, and the CM is on the same side of the table coming from the back. Um, and uh, so now you can take an X-ray here uh, once the cup is in position. Um, so typically with the anterior approach, you don't want to uh, put in too much antiversion. So because that increases the risk of uh, anterior instability. So uh, typically not more than 20 degrees of antiversion and about 40 degrees of inclination. And uh, you can you know, take you know, X-rays as needed to make sure that you're happy with the position of the cup. Um, and compare that with the previous, uh, from preoperative pelvic X-rays. Uh, and you need to make sure that you have good pre-op pre -op pelvic X-rays um, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, so that you can compare that with intraoperative X-rays. Um, so once you have the cup in place, now we have to move on to the femur. So the, for the femur, exposure is, is, is typically the difficult part of the surgery, I think, because we need to get the femur up into the wound uh, to uh, prepare the femur. So you need to get the leg end of the table down to get hyperextension, uh, typically about you know, 20 degrees, 25 degrees. And if you need more, you can bring the table into like Trendelenburg and then bring the leg back down further to you know get a get about maybe 40 degrees or 45 degrees of hyperextension. So this is how this is the anatomy um, we need to be familiar with uh, when we are doing the femur releases. So uh, that's you can see on the left side here the uh, retractor is pulling the gluteus minimus and medius away. So that's for those uh, the abductor tendons are protected and uh, that will expose the, the superior capsule, then the operator internus with the gemini, there's the conjoint tendon here. This is, uh, this is where they typically attach. This is the right hip on the right-hand side here. And uh, the pyophormis is all the way in the posterior superior corner of the greater trochanter. And operator externus over here that's attached or the, uh, that attaches in the pyophormis fossa. So there are, there, there are many publications on this. There are many anatomical studies. So uh, you need to get this one, get more familiar with this anatomy uh, to get a good uh, release of the femur. And typically, most of the time, you should be able to get a good exposure by releasing the superior capsule and the conjoint tendon. And if it is still tight, if you're still not able to get the femur up all the way, then you may have to go and release the pyphormis tendon also. Most of the time, so I think very, very, very occasionally you may have to release the operator externus, but that is very, very uncommon. A large majority of the time uh, with superior capsule and the conjoint tendon releases, you should be able to uh, lift the femur up nicely. Um, so how do you do that? Uh, this, is, uh, this is a cadaveric picture here. So you can uh, pull the femur up with a bone hook. Uh, this picture shows like a rake type of retractor, but you can take a large bone hook, go into the femoral canal, and then uh, pull the femur up so that you have the tissues under tension. 
and you have uh, a, a retractor like here, a long Cobra, or I use something called a Bozeman retractor, which goes over the tip of the radial decanter, thereby exposing the superior capsule and all the structures over here. Um, so you can place a double prong mirror on the middle side of the neck there to push the femur up. And that's where you're going to release. Uh, that red line shows there, starting from all the way up in the neck here, going posterior superiorly to release the capsule, the conjoint tendon, and if necessary, you can go all the way to the posterior superior corner to release the pyroformis tendon there. Um, we need to make sure that everything is released. That will help in bringing the femur up. So you can definitely, you know, you had to hold the femur up manually uh, to when you're doing the releases, and then you can put the retractor to keep it lifted up. I've been using this uh, this table mounted uh, femur elevator. This definitely, you know, it will you know reduce your work so that it can it it will hold the femur up when you're doing the releases, and once the releases are done, you can keep the femur there uh, to. Uh, to prepare the femur uh, for broaching and for placing the components. So basically just a, 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 a device which goes on to the side other uh, than the side rail, like here. So it's attached on the side rail over here. There is a bone hook, a special bone hook, which goes um, on lateral to the uh, vastus lateralis, uh, obviously deep to the TFL. Um, and then you should be able to typically feel the vastus ridge laterally and it goes right around it. So this is typically where the, uh, the femur elevator goes when you're using a specialized table, like a fracture table, there is an ele elevator that also, also goes in the same position there. And now this, uh, this device attaches onto the bone hook and then there is a ratchet mechanism here. You can uh, you know, turn the ratchet to lift the femur up. Before you do the releases, you don't want to uh, lift up too much. You just want to lift up enough to maintain some tension. Then you do the releases, and then you can you know lift up further um, to you know get the femur into position. So this is how the leg position would be when you uh, uh, when while you are preparing the femur, you have to get the operative leg um, under the non-operative leg. Uh, if you have both the legs prepped and the assistant on the opposite side uh, keeps it in uh, external rotation and maximum adduction. So this will expose the proximal femur better. At the same time, this elevator will help in keeping it up. Um, so make sure that opposite uh, the assistant on that side is pushing that uh, the upper leg in external rotation and adduction. So this is how the exposure looks like. So here you can see the, the anterior posterior, the medial lateral side of the femoral neck there. Uh, this is the left hip again, and you want to get a good uh, starting point. It's very important that you lateralize appropriately and also start posteriorly, uh, posteriorly enough. Otherwise, Sometimes with the sharp brooches, you know, if you start too much anteriorly because of the, um, as you know, the anterior bow of the femur, you might end up perforating the posterior lateral, uh, the corner of the femur. So you want to start all the way posteriorly so that you negotiate through the anterior uh, femur bow. So typically uh, divide this, the femur uh, neck into four parts there like that. And you want to start right there. You want to start all the way lateral and posteriorly uh, to uh, appropriate for the appropriate positioning of your component. So initially start off with the box osteotome like that to lateralize uh, appropriately and also maintain the version and then use a blunt tip uh, rasp like that going uh, through the canal to find the canal appropriately and to find the proper direction of the canal. Um, it's very important to have double ops offset brooches here. So most companies um, you know, make these and it's very important that you have appropriate instruments. Uh, it, it becomes really difficult like we use in posterior approach. Posterior approach, you know, the femur is typically very well exposed and you have just a straight uh, brooch handle. But for this approach, it's very important to have this double offset brooch, which is you know, bringing it up and also out uh, to you know, get, get access to the femur. 
And then it's very important you uh, push the brooch down to lateralize and also push the brooch towards the patient uh, so that you get a good posterior posterization. Um, and then definitely uh, you can take multiple x-rays during if we can, you know, if you start off with a couple of brooches and if you just want to make sure uh, you can, you have to take all of those things out uh, to get an x-ray and then bring it to lateral and AP view to make sure that the brooch is in, you know, good position. If you want to, if it is going in us, then obviously then you can um, expose the femur again and then uh, go back and uh, approach laterally so that you you know maintain the proper uh, uh, medial lateral position. And then um, then so once you have the brooch in there, then uh, based on the preoperative templating, uh, we can use a standard offset or high, high offset neck and then appropriate uh, uh, neck length and reduce the hip. And so this is the advantage of uh, prepping both the legs. Then now you can bring them uh, together and then feel your medial malleoli and assess the leg lens. Uh, and of course, you have to make sure that the pelvis is not tilted because when you're moving the patient around, uh, the, pel if the pelvis is tilted, that might give you a wrong, uh, you know, wrong leg lens. So make sure the pelvis is tilted, uh, I'm not tilted, and uh, feel the legs, uh, the medial malleoli together. And also now you have to uh, test the stability of the hip. So bring the non-operative leg all the way out so that you can bring the operative leg into maximum adduction and exhortation. And um, I typically put my hand in there and feel the stability, you feel for any subluxation of the femoral head and bring, the, bring it into abduction and exhortation. Uh, and then uh, put it in figure of four position to see if it is stable in that position. So this is testing for anterior stability. And then I test for posterior stability here. So you go into 90 degree flexion and internal and external rotation. Uh, you don't have to you know, push it or stress it, but just with the free, uh, let it move freely, see if it subluxates posteriorly uh, in this position. So once you're done with the stability and you're happy with the leg lens, then, um, then you, you know, basically dislocate it again and uh, get the brooches out, brooch out and then put your final component in. Um, and then if you want to test uh, the, if you want to uh, do a trial reduction again, you can do it with the final stem in there. Uh, otherwise you can go part of the final component. So uh, I use, uh, with the anterior approach, like again, uh, the femur exposure is the, usually the difficult part. And if you use a standard lens stem, uh, it might be a little difficult. So I use a smaller lens stem like this. This is, uh, uh, most companies have a smaller lens stem like this. And uh, studies have shown that they do equally good. Um, uh, so uh, it's, this will be helpful. Um, and then, uh, so that anterior approach with, uh, it can be definitely safely done on a standard table. And uh, it's very important you have appropriate instruments um, and intraoperative intra x-rays. Uh, definitely it's easier to do it because the patient is supine uh, and that helps with, uh, with the proper position of the components. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu, for this uh, amazing presentation. Uh, Prabhu, you can stop sharing, actually. Stop sharing, actually. Okay. Stop sharing. There you go. And uh, please return your video as well. All right. Yeah, thank you, Prabhu, for this uh, brilliant presentation. And uh, absolutely delighted to see some of the great surgical steps. And uh, Prabhu, a few questions from our side. Sure. Uh, Prabhu, do you think uh, the direct anterior approach has a slightly higher rate of complications compared to the other direct lateral or uh, postlateral approach of the head? That is true. There are many studies have shown that, especially in the beginning of the learning curve, the, the incidence of complications are higher. Uh, especially on the femur side. Intraoperative factors have been shown to be higher, definitely. Um, and there are some, uh, some publications have shown there's some higher risk of wound complications, but nobody has shown a 
higher risk of deep infection, but wound because you know you've been trying to do it with a smaller approach. So uh, the wound superficial wound complications also have been shown to be higher. Yes. And do you think uh, the DA approach offers you to do in a mis way much better than the other other uh, approaches in a minimal invasive way? The direct hand. Yeah, so the, I mean, again, there are many studies. Again, there are now we have randomized uh, studies also showing the difference. The main advantage is, uh, so yeah, yeah, probably a smaller incision as compared to the post approach. That's not the biggest thing. Um, you know, it's supposed to be, uh, you know, it's muscle sparing because it's a true internervous plane and you're not cutting through any of the muscles except, you know, obviously for the external superiorly. Other than that, unlike in the posterior approach or the lateral approach, uh, the, uh, the abductors are mainly, you know, safer. Uh, but it has it, it has its uh, you know difficulties. It's not an easy approach. It's not, uh, especially with the femur side, uh, it's difficult to you know, get the femur up properly. That's why the femur side complications are higher. Um, so. Um, as far as the advantages and disadvantages, main advantages uh, people have shown that you know faster rehab, uh, slightly lesser pain post-op, you know maybe slightly faster uh, discharge from the hospital. Um, and then this is again in the first three weeks probably, uh, maybe four weeks. And after that, once or beyond six weeks, um, there has not been shown to be a significant difference as far as the pain or the uh, you know, rehab potential. And uh, Prabhu, just one last question. Uh, Prabhu, do you think sure. the DA approach is being used more of as a marketing? Because if you look at the last uh, uh, the last ten years, there are so many proponents of the DA approach, especially in the US, compared to the uh, other countries. Yeah. If you search DA approach, uh, you'll you'll encounter at least thousands of websites. Uh, Saying uh, proponents of the DA approach. So, do you think there is a heavy uh, industry influence? There is definitely. There is. Over the last 10, 15 years, you know, there have been people have done many surveys among the hip and knee surgeons here, and it has gone up significantly. So, uh, again, so as people are learning it, uh, most uh, when I was doing fellowship, I, you know, there was no dirt amputee approach at that time at all, you know, where I did the fellowship. It was, I, I was, you know, we, we used to hear, yeah, somebody is teaching over there, somebody is teaching over there, but not many, but now most fellowships are teaching it. Um, so it's very important to learn that way, you know, during your residency, during your fellowship, so that, you know, you learn it in the proper way. But yeah, there has been a lot of industrial, you know, uh, push from the industry, but it has taken off. And um, if obviously, like any surgery, you know, you need to learn it and do it properly as to you know, get the benefits of it. Thank you, Prabhu. Prabhu, I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for yet another fantastic talk. And I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people.